Welcome along to another Al's Geek Lab. Today's video is sad because it's the last year of the series of the top 10 games of the first decade of the PC. So much has changed over these years. I'll do a recap video soon, I think. But for now, I'm just going to focus on this year, 1991. The games you're seeing here, Castles, Goblins, Degeneration and 4D Boxing are all absolute banger games of 1991. This is another year where it would have been a lot easier to make a top 20. Almost all of the hit games of 1991 were now available in glorious 256 colour VGA, many exclusively. Most had MIDI or digitised audio, and whilst the war of Amiga vs PC still raged on, the PC was drawing parallels at almost every occasion. Let's get on with 1991. In at number 10 then is The Terminator. For a film that came out in 1984, this game really took its time coming out. It came out at the same time as Terminator 2 was out in the movies. In 1989, a wee bit earlier, VET came out, which was pretty much a sandbox game. You could drive around, without too much in the way of rules, in a massive expanse. Kind of like Grand Theft Auto. At its heart though, VET was a driving game. The Terminator loosely follows the story of the first film, however it takes a leaf from the VET book. Bethesda Softworks, who are still going strong today, made the Terminator a pretty advanced game. Written in pure assembly and over 35,000 lines of code, you start off as Kyle Reese to protect Sarah Connor from the cyborg sent back in time to kill her. Or you can be a nasty little bastard and play the Terminator himself and go after Reese and Sarah. Instead of San Francisco and Vet, the map is off Los Angeles and is beastly in size, effectively 10 by 6 miles. It's all in 3D and there are familiar landmarks such as the Dodger Stadium, Griffiths Park and the Silver Lake Reservoir. Just like GTA, there's a map of the city. You can walk around, talk to people, make unethical decisions like hijack cars and drive them around and then of course there's the shooting. This game was a first person shooter at its heart and a driving game that came out just before Wolfenstein and way before Grand Theft Auto. A major accomplishment that would run even on a 286 due to its tight coding. The first time I played Scorched Earth I went to a pal David's house. He was a bit older than me and had the moolah for a fancy VGA 386. And whilst I was still kicking my mono XT for at least another year or so, this lucky plonker had a fairly high res display so he could play Scorched Earth as it was intended. If you're an avid fan, read Al's Geek Lab Nerd, of my top 10 videos, then you'll remember Nightfire from 1986. The game was simple, you were a tank and you chose the angle and velocity of your gun, a randomly drawn landscape would be presented to you, you take your turn to guess which velocity and angle was correct in order to strike your opponent, which was another real player. In Scorched Earth, it's a modernised version of the same sort of thing. You can play against many opponents, including the CPU. There are fancy weapons to choose from, including a bit of napalm, which always warmed my cockles. One cannot simply get the weapons without having the money though. To get the moolah, you need to defeat your enemy. I don't know what it is about these simple games, but they're so addictive and Scorched Earth is the mother when it comes to these sort of games. It's got adverse weather conditions, different terrain and a bit of humour in places, therefore it gets number 9. In at number 8 then is Sid Meier's Civilization. Sid Meier had been at the peak of strategy and simulation games for almost the entirety of the 1980s. It's like he was coding on crack because the boy never stopped pumping out bangers, left, right and centre. However, some would say that Civilization is his seminal hit. I mean, where else can you go after building an entire freaking human civilization? If you haven't played Civ yet, then basically you start off with a sparse map where over thousands of years you get the chance to develop as you see fit. You can set governments, tax your minions, research new technologies such as pottery, the wheel, all the way through to spaceflight. 
you can go to war with other civilizations that are controlled by the computer, or if, if you want, you can be a peace-loving deity that leads your empire through alliances. The game went on to sell a cool 1.5 million copies. It's had many remakes, including a multiplayer one in 1995. When you start off, you get a choice to use historical or modern civilization types. When you start your randomly generated world, you need to do a bit of exploring and building before you can get started on your quest. Civilizations include the Americans, the Aztecs, Mongols and Romans, and you'll start in the year 4000 BC and can go up to 2100 AD. If you think about the good bits from SimCity, Populous and even Railroad Tycoon, mush them together then you get something that looks like Civilization. If that sort of game is your bag, then Civilization is definitely for you. In at number 7 is Catacomb 3D and Hover Tank 3D. This is the first cheat that you're going to see me make in this top 10. Sorry, not sorry. Id Software had been smashing out the games for soft disk for a while. The Commander Keen series, for example, was still being foisted upon us all. However, the crazy ideas from the deep had already begun. By April of 1991, Carmack & Co released Hover Tank 3D. Think Doom, but in a hovercraft that bobs, and you have to rescue damsels and dudes in distress and defeat any aliens in your way, but also with really crap graphics. Note in this game the lack of textures on the walls, and also note the off-puttingly orgasmic noise that is emitted when you pick up one of your captured cretins. <laughs> Each level has a countdown timer to add a little bit of suspense, and once you complete a level, you are doled out with a big wad of cash, depending on how many captives you save. Fast forward towards the end of the year, and id have been busy updating that engine to provide texture mapped walls in Catacomb 3D, which is a 3D version of their earlier Catacomb series. In all its EGA wonder, you can clearly see that Wolfenstein 3D was just around the corner. I find these games incredibly interesting because to me they feel like an alpha and a beta version of Wolf 3D respectively. The map in Hover Tank is a little helpful, but it's still incredibly difficult to navigate and the lack of textured walls make it hard to get your bearings after just a few minutes. The fact that there is no animation on the captives and very poor animation on the baddies in Hover Tank makes it even worse. In Catacombs, the baddies are animated. There are also treasures and door keys, just like Wolf 3D. I also like the fact that this is playable on a fairly low-end PC and is EGA rather than VGA only. I'm cheating again. Number 6 covers another two games from another company. This time, it's Sierra, with Police Quest 3 and Space Quest 4. 1991 saw the first year of a new version of Sierra's Creative Interpreter. Both games saw a refreshed interface, no more typing, an icon-based, mouse-driven system was now in place. With Police Quest 3, none other than Jan Hammer of Miami Vice fame produced the music for the game, and Mark Crow of Space Quest fame did the art and directed the game too. The game continues with Sonny Bonds, now a sergeant who is looking for a more peaceful life with his wife Marie. Unfortunately, Sonny's desire for a more peaceful life will not be met as his wife is attacked. The level of realism and the digitised graphics in this game are top notch. If you're a fan of the Police Quest series, you may like this one more than the other ones. The original AGI version was redone at the same time and in most cases I'm happiest with the original AGI versions including Leisure Suit Larry. However, Police Quest 1 was a lot easier to play when it was in the VGA mode and had decent driving controls. With Space Quest 4, the game sees our plunger-wielding protagonist return once again, this time reprising Sludge Vohol. We all thought he was long gone at the end of Space Quest 2, but there's nothing like a bit of story bending and a good splash of time distortion to remedy that one. Although not in the initial release, the entire game had digitised speech in a later version. The portrait drawn graphics to some may appear artistic, but to me they haven't stood up as well as the graphics in Space Quest 2 or Space Quest 3 for that matter. I also found the humour and the stories a little bit tiresome compared with Space Quest 3. Still a worthy game of a top 10, however. Number 5 then, it's Monkey Island 2. 
I spent ages prattling on in my last video on 1990 on the review of Monkey Island, so I'll give you a break from extolling those virtues again. This game takes place in the not too distant future after the end of Monkey Island 1. Guybrush Threepwood is looking for the mysterious treasure of Big Whoop. It's not long before a mishap involving LeChuck's old first mate Largo ensues. Guybrush stupidly shows Largo the LeChuck beard clipping he took from him when he defeated him in the first game. Naturally, with all things ghost, one can be reincarnated simply with a little bit of beard hair, to which LeChuck comes back as a zombie and the terror ensues. Just as Monkey Island before it, the game was a critical success, but not so much a commercial one. For a game that is still about pirates, it's a wee bit ironic, therefore, that everyone and their dog pirated it. The art is great, the music is great, the humour is still top notch, and the story is almost as good as part one. If you haven't played Monkey Island 2, just do it. At number four then, everyone's favourite filthy friend is back in its fourth, yes fourth, instalment of Leisure Suit Larry. Al Lowe thought it would be funny to skip a number, which has led to many a flame war on Twitter and Reddit, which the joke, well, it still rumbles on to this day. Well done, Al, for making a joke that has lasted 29 years with Leisure Suit Larry 5. Anyway, at the end of Leisure Suit Larry 3, our hapless hero eventually managed to find love in the right place. And now that Larry Laffer and his partner in crime passionate Patty, the game gives you the ability to play as both Patty and Larry at different parts throughout the game. The game opens with Larry suffering from a case of amnesia and working for a mafia-run pornography company called Porn Prod Corp. When you play Patty, you start working as an FBI agent to dig up evidence that record companies are hiding subliminal messages in their songs. Although the backstories are disparate in the beginning, obviously our lovers' paths intertwine and by the end Patty and Larry are back together. Larry 5 was a far shorter game than Larry 3. If Larry 3 was the Stephen King novel, then Larry 5 would be a Mills and Boone. Not that size ever caused an issue for Larry. The addition of the first Larry to feature a point and click interface helped make the gameplay a bit easier and the puzzle seemed a little bit easier too. The ways to die were also a little bit more forgiving. I'm still torn on whether this is one of the better Larrys or whether it's one of the worst. Either way, all of the Sierra Larry games are wonderful. And now is number three. So I'm really, really cheating here, but bear with me. If you had to pick 10 games from 1991, which ones would you choose? It's not easy. So I'm going to lump all of the good platformers in one big number three. There were many platformers in 1991. Id Software had proven that the PC could do Nintendo-style smooth side-scrolling in 1990 with Commander Keen, and so it wasn't long before everyone else was in on the action. Let's start out with the most basic looking of the platformers and work our way up then. Firstly, here's the Monuments of Mars. You may scoff at the graphics that take that baby poop colour from the CGA palette, but if you scratch the surface, it's a really great game. For its modest looks, it's actually a pretty demanding game on the PC. The author recommends having a 286 or 386 to play it, stating that it will almost definitely not work on an XT. This sets of puzzles that carefully time jumps and the limited ammo make for much more than just your stock standard shoot the living blazes out of everything kind of game. Next, here's Duke Nukem. Compared to some of the other games in this list, good old Duke looks a little bit dated. It also sounds dated as well because it's only got PC speaker sounds. However, it still plays well with its fast action and power-ups aplenty. Imagine if the young Duke you see before you knew that we'd still be hailing to the king 30 years later. Fantasy World Dizzy is next. I played Dizzy on the ZX Spectrum when I was a kid, mainly Prince of the Yoke Folk. I didn't know why it was so fun, but the thought of rolling around clumsily without being broken, boiled or fried appealed to me then and somehow it still does now. You have a limited inventory of three items, so sometimes you need to think strategically about which items you pick up and which that you drop. The puzzles go from over easy to hard boiled in seconds. The game originally came out in 1989 on the 8-bit micros, but you can see that this VGA port was quite the looker compared to those. Get this, 
In 2004, the game was rated as number 25 in the top 50 games of all time by your Sinclair magazine. Not bad for a game character straight out of Gordon Ramsay's cookbook. Then it's The Simpsons. There were a few Simpsons games released all around the same time. Not a shock given that The Simpsons started airing this year and was an overnight success. This game was my favourite and was quite playable. You play your choice of Homer, Marge, Lisa or Bart and the plot is that Maggie has mistakenly taken possession of a large diamond and is using it as a dummy. One of the more tenuous plots, I'm sure you will agree. Smithers had earlier stolen this diamond to give to his boss, Mr. Burns. Why the millionaire needs a jewel, I have got no idea. But since Maggie has the diamond, Smithers decides to kidnap her. It is your mission to fend off wave after wave of baddies, who presumably are all on Smithers' side. Before you face off the end of the level bosses, the last one being Mr. Burns himself. To win the game, you need to rescue little Maggie. French company Titus had a growing reputation in the late 80s as a bunch of coders that knew their stuff in making fast-paced sprite games. By 1991, they were smashing out the hits. Two of them were The Blues Brothers and Prehistoric. For both of these games, the audio is lovely, the graphics are really well drawn, the gameplay is compelling, Titus didn't really need to tell stories with their platformers, or really any of their games for that matter. The reason they didn't need to tell stories is that for most of their games, they could just be picked up and played straight away. They were addictive and well engineered, and that's what everyone wants in a game, right? Finally, there is Gods. Talking about well engineered, Gods is another prime example of tight coding, superb graphics, sprites and gameplay. Three guesses who made gods? If you said anything other than the Bitmap Brothers, then you haven't been paying attention to my other videos. In gods, you play the Greek legend Hercules. Your quest is to achieve immortality. You'll be granted immunity by the gods of the citadel at Mount Olympus if you can overthrow the four guardians who have invaded the citadel. On the face of it, Gods looks like any other platformer, but played with a little bit of planning and good timing, you can have a much more rewarding experience. Furthermore, there are switches and levers to pull, boxes to push and an inventory in which you can hold keys to doors and so forth. The enemies have adaptable AI, there are various weapons to buy from a trader just like with Xenon 2 the year before, and the weapons can be used at the same time, and the end of level baddies are very satisfying to kill. Definitely a breakthrough platformer for the PC. In at number two then. Depending on where you were in the world, this game was either called Out of This World or Another World. Published by the French company Delphine Software in 1991 in Europe and in 1992 in the USA, Another World is an absolute game changer. Pun intended. I mean, just look at it. Even today, I look at the graphics and I think, they don't look half bad. If it came out today, would people still play it with those graphics? Yeah, I reckon they probably would. The first thing that hits you about Another World is the cinematic feel to the game. What you might not know about this game is it was coded by just one man, Eric Shahi. He did the game engine, the art, the story. He even did a bit of the soundtrack, although he did get help with that. Eric lovingly made the game over two years. How he accomplished this with the hardware that was available between 1989 and 1991 was nothing short of a miracle. When you first start the game, you're greeted by the backstory. Lester, a scientist who is experimenting with some sort of particle accelerator that looks like some Hadron Collider out of CERN, he drives up to the lab one night to try an experiment he's been thinking of. Nobody is in the office, the lights are low, and he begins the experiment. It all goes horribly wrong. A quick flash of wayward lightning and the computer terminal and desk he's sitting at vanish, taking Lester with it. A blink of an eye later, the desk and the computer and a chunk of the ground that the desk was sitting on are falling through an expanse of water. With that, you're launched into the game and have to swim to the top before you are consumed by watery monsters. When I first played this, I figured that I was still watching a cutscene because the graphics were still the same as the intro movie. The cinematic cutscenes are per pervasive throughout the game, but rather than detract from the game like so many games that came later in the 90s, Another World blends the two perfectly. 
The lack of verbal dialogue is another quaint feature of the game that adds to the mystery. Like an old French silent movie, if you think about it. You're given no real clues as to what to do in the game. You're just in another world. You have to fight off all kinds of scary alien enemies and find your way through puzzles that you really have to be creative to get around. Later in the game, you find a laser pistol, which allows you to hit enemies as well as create a force field and also break down some walls. One thing to note about Another World though, and probably the main reason I didn't stick around to complete it, is because it's just incredibly hard. Just one hit and you're dead at any time throughout the game. Just as much as one little nick on your foot from a floor slug will take you right back to the beginning of the game. There are save points later, but they are few and far between. The controls can be a bit fiddly too. Either that, in some cases it feels like the collision detection is just off a little bit. There are puzzles which really get you saying, come on, a few times. So from that perspective, once you get over the excellent cinematography, you'll find the gameplay a bit too tedious in some places. Well, what can I say about our number one game? The games in these top 10 lists have always been about fun, first and foremost. More points are given for originality, and then of course graphics and sound, as well as the backstory. Lemmings, unless I'm mistaken, has pretty much no backstory, so let's count that out. And then there are graphics and sound. The music is lively, upbeat, midi affair with some cutesy sound effects here and there, but hardly anything to write home about. The graphics are static backgrounds, the EGA and VGA versions look okay, but the CGA version looks like someone had been drinking purple Mountain Dew all day, washed it down with a quart of milk, and then got busy in the latrine. The animation of our little lemmings are nice enough, but hardly award winning. And there's only a few pixels high. So why is this game at number one, I hear you cry? Well, actually, I don't hear you cry at all because I'm in my house working on this damn video and unless you're not alive during the 90s, you'll have already played Lemmings and you'll know how much fun it is. Good on you though if you're watching this video and you weren't alive during the 90s though. Let me know in the comments if that's you. Anyway, whilst it's possible to play Lemmings with the keyboard, in 1991 most people were rodent owners, and so the mouse was the recommended way to play this title. Lemmings, just in case you didn't know, are dumb. Really dumb. In Psygnosis' game, they walk into the level and blindly walk forward until they hit something or fall off an edge. If they hit something hard like a wall, they'll about turn and head back the way they came. If it hits something less hard, they may walk upwards if it's not too steep, or walk towards some other form of elaborate death. Either way, the aim of the game is simple, rescue those lemmings. To do this, you need to get a certain percentage of them out of the exit door. You click on the lemming and give it a task to perform. These tasks include climbing, floating, bashing and building. In some levels, the percentage that you need to actually rescue can be quite low and this means in some cases you have to forfeit a lemming or two. Blockers, for example, can't be converted back into normal lemmings once they are committed to that job. So at the end of the level you can hit the nuke button and blow them to smithereens, which despite their cutesy demeanour and your overall goal of saving these guys, it's oddly satisfying. The levels get continually harder, so much so that getting to the end, the hundredth level, is so difficult you may decide to stop playing after a while. Lemmings deserves to be at number one because despite the fact that I was one of those people who stopped playing it after a time, I soon came back to it. Then I stopped for years, and then I came back to it again. I even did the same on a mobile version of it I downloaded a few years ago. But just like people play Sudoku, Connect 4 and Snakes and Ladders, people are still going to be playing Lemmings for a very long time to come. No matter what incarnation it becomes, it is still a timeless classic. Well, that about wraps up 1991 and concludes the games from the first decade of the PC. What did you think of my choices? If you thought they were right on, then I'll buy you an ice cream. I'm sure that I won't be down many dollars. But that's because choosing a top 10 for 1991 was so hard, even to the point of cheating a number of times, there were still so many games that could deserve a spot at the top 10 table. Regardless, I do hope you've enjoyed this video, and if you haven't checked out the other videos in the series, now that the series is complete, why not check them out? If you're lucky, I might even do a summary video. 
Until the next visit to Al's Geek Lab, I thank you very much for watching. I have lots of other videos on retro computing, retro gaming, and more stuff, so feel free to have a peruse around. If you like my stuff, then a wee click on that subscribe button will not only reward you with regular quality content, but also reward me with the warm, fuzzy feelings of people liking what I'm doing. Win-win, right? That's all folks, take care and be excellent to each other.